what Professor Bob is your only hope in life and in death? My answer is the answer that's been confessed for centuries in my tradition. Uh, my only hope in life and in death is that I'm not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful savior, Jesus Christ. Can you tell us a bit more about how in contemporary settings there is discrimination against conservative biblical scholars? I will just say there, there have been many cases of, of qualified scholars who've been de denied advancement because um, of, of their open biblical convictions. And, and an example I, I would point to that, that's, that is public, uh, Ulrich Wilkins, a, a retired German uh, bishop and a New Testament scholar. So a provocative question could be, if Martin Luther John Calvin, Ursinus from Heidelberg, and even Schlatter would be with us today. Do you think they would have been willing to teach at secular universities where all sorts of new policies have been brought in that might lead a person to compromise his convictions? Uh, I I'm sure it would be baffling uh, to many of them as to why uh, teachers of Christian conviction uh, would be part of establishments which are uh, so radically anti-Christian. More and more you have people whose convictions are hostile to Christianity and they're teaching ministers, they're teaching theologians. They're, they're setting the table for upcoming generations by the way that they're uh, shaping the minds and the souls of, of those that they're teaching. And, and I think to, to summarize my answer to your question, I think Schlatter and others would feel like it was, would be a contradiction in terms. Good day, my Christian friends, and welcome back to Evangelical Platform, a ministry dedicated to preserving the gospel in a complex, messy, postmodern world. I'm Dr. Frederick Mulder. I live in England. I came here about 14 years ago to do a second master's degree on the resurrection of Jesus at Durham University, and then a PhD in Holland, also on the resurrection of Jesus. I lectured there. I lectured in England for a few years, and now I'm full-time in this ministry, passionately dedicated to challenging and equipping Christians to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, especially in mainline churches and secular universities. If that is you, or you have friends who need to hear this message, why won't you send it on to encourage them as well? Today I have the privilege of having an interview with one of my biblical studies heroes of 20 years ago. I remember at the University of Pretoria I struggled with liberal theology and then I discovered Professor Bob Yarbrough from Covenant Theological Seminary. Um, we were battling historical critical developments at our faculty and one day I visited a, a Baptist pastor called Dr. Martin Holt. Um, in Constantia Park, and then he got me 30 copies of this book from Professor Bob Yarbrough to disseminate among students. And then I started to read Professor Bob Yarbrough's work. Eventually, I discovered his work on Adolf Schlatter and others. And uh, today I have the privilege to interview him in America. The signal is not 100% perfect, so just bear with us. Uh, we're going to have about 10, 12 questions today. And by the end of this, I hope if you are a conservative evangelical, if you're a theology student and you are battling liberalism, I hope that this will encourage you and give you hope for the road ahead. Professor Bob, thank you so much for joining us today. Let's start with a first question. Can you tell us a bit more about where you grew up and how you got this call to do theological studies? Uh, I grew up in the, the Midwest in the U.S., and uh, when I was a young adult, I was uh, working in the forest, cutting down trees. And um, I became active in a local church and I began to grow spiritually. And uh, I perceived a call to really uh, become serious about discipleship. So uh, through learning, uh, by practical ministry attempts in the local church that I didn't know anything about the Word of God or about ministry either, um, I decided I would uh, go to college and get a degree in, in uh, religion and study the New Testament. And I tried to do that. 
and I just learned that a bachelor's degree in uh, religious studies is enough to make you dangerous. So I ended up then uh, doing a, an, an MA degree at Wheaton College Graduate School. And from there, I went into uh, uh, PhD work at the University of Aberdeen. Uh, so really, you could say that my call to theological studies came through a call to minister in the local church. Thank you very much for that, Prof. Bob. There are probably not many postgraduate theology students wanting to do a PhD on conservative German biblical scholars. Can you tell us briefly what inspired you to pursue a PhD in New Testament at Aberdeen University and how the results of your scholarship have really impacted your academic career? Well, the direct reason that I chose uh, the University of Aberdeen was uh, in my own personal studies uh, and preaching, I was trying to understand Johannine epistles and uh, I, Howard Marshall at the University of Aberdeen, had written one of the best, and still one of the best, uh, commentaries on the Johannine Epistles. So it was Howard Marshall's writings, his exegetical writings, that first attracted me to, to Aberdeen. And uh, finishing up at Wheaton College Graduate School, um, I, I also applied to, uh, to an Ivy League school to do a PhD, and, and I was accepted, but it was clear there, in fact, they, they told me uh, you as an evangelical will not be allowed to work in anything directly related to the New Testament because we would assume that you're not capable of uh, impartial scholarship. So the scholar said, uh, you'll work on Septuagint lexicography or maybe second or third century Christianity. Well, Aberdeen accepted me and uh, uh, it was clear that I, I might be able to do a topic of hermeneutical and theological interest. So in the end, even though uh, my wife and I didn't see financially how we would be able to make it, we accepted uh, the invitation to come to Aberdeen. And um, the result of, of that uh, was really twofold. One is I made great connections with a number of colleagues that were either students there when I was there or afterward, like uh, Eckhart Schnabel and Hans Beyer and Clinton Arnold, uh, Gary Shogren, who's uh, ministered in Central America for years, Phil Towner, who's written uh, the best English language commentary on the pastors that there is, uh, Daryl Bach and Craig Blomberg. These are just some of the scholars that I have a connection with because of my time at Aberdeen. And then my PhD thesis uh, ended up mapping out uh, the history of New Testament studies and the main hermeneutical currents in a way that uh, helps me to continue to make sense of uh, the discipline of New Testament studies. Wonderful, thank you. I met Howard Marshall at the Tyndale Fellowship a couple of years ago, and also uh, a number of others that you know, uh, Daryl Bock, um, also at, in, at Tyndale, and also Professor Craig Blomberg. I had wonderful conversations with him about the Gospels also at Tyndale House. Now, just before we go on, for students who are listening, the names that Professor Bob just mentioned, you will do really well to make notes of uh, them and go get those books as supplements for your theological studies. Professor Bob, can you just tell us a bit more about how you discovered Adolf Schlatter and also place him for us within the big picture of theological development since the Protestant Reformation, please? Uh, I discovered Schlatter... Uh, most directly through one of my teachers at Wheaton College Graduate School, uh, J. Julius Scott Jr. And he called my attention to a book by Robert Morgan at Oxford University. And uh, this was a, a long introductory essay. And then it was um, uh, a translation and commentary on a long essay by William Vreda who sort of championed the history of religions approach to uh, biblical theology or New Testament theology. And then there was a long essay by Adolf Schlatter um, on the theology of the New Testament and dogmatics. So uh, that's how I got interested in Schlatter in my MA work. Hmm. And uh, as far as Schlatter's place, uh, he, he's important because of the volume of his publications and the influence he had, especially on the popular level, but also the academic level in Germany uh, and, and Switzerland from the late 1800s on. Uh, we can uh, place them sort of like this. There's, there's the Protestant Reformation, 
And there's, there's a rise of what's called Protestant scholasticism, which uh, had some bad things associated with it and, and some good things. It's, it's carrying on the air of the Reformation into the 1600s and, and into the 1700s. There's a reaction against uh, Protestant scholasticism in the form of pietism. So these are scholars like uh, Franca and Spener in Germany who, who react to what they perceived as sort of, a, mm. a, of an arid and uh, unspiritual uh, quality to the theology that, that was emerging and a sort of, a, of a, a, a rationalism that they found unhealthy. So there's a, a pietist reaction. And as we go into the, uh, the 1700s, there's both traditions. There's a pietist tradition and then there's also uh, a, an intellectual tradition. And not all the pietist tradition was good and not all the intellectual tradition was bad. Uh, but, but then the Enlightenment comes along in the late 1700s in Germany and sort of uh, overturns uh, more or less everything. And uh, out of the Enlightenment emerges what comes to be called by the, uh, the middle of the 1800s, uh, Protestant liberalism. And uh, about the time Schlatter is born, uh, a, a view of Christianity that sort of uh, relabels everything's, everything and, and uh, plugs more into German idealism than into the, the biblical gospel of Christ crucified and risen. That this uh, liberal tradition becomes dominant. And it's, it's this time and this time period in which Schlatter is born. And, and interestingly, his father, was more of a, of a free church pietist in Switzerland and his mother stayed in the reformed church. So he grew up in a, a relatively divided household, but, but he said what united our, my parents was their mutual faith in Jesus. So they, they never broke uh, their relation with each other and they, they encouraged both of their children in a both theologically robust appreciation for Christianity, which would come from the reform side and also uh, a personal uh, relationship with Jesus Christ idea of Christianity, which was inherited from his father and his father's side. Thank you, Prof. Bob. Yes, can you just tell us a little bit more about why the philosopher Immanuel Kant was so crucial? We know that Schlatter encountered his work already in high school, also liberal theology. And tell us how significant Kant was and how Schlatter was able to counter Immanuel Kant's philosophy also in his biblical studies? Well, as far as the importance of Kant, uh, that's really a, a specialist question. And uh, it is said in philosophy, uh, you can philosophize with Kant, or you can philosophize against Kant, but you can't philosophize without Kant. And uh, in biblical studies, the question probably is not so much uh, exactly how Kant uh, can be traced forward generation by generation. Uh, but it is rather that by the middle of the 1800s, there's the rise of what scholars came to call neo-Kantianism. And it was a construal of Kant uh, that in conjunction with other philosophers who were uh, normative in the German university, uh, placed a certain, a certain spin on how the Bible was read and, and how theology was practiced. And uh, Kant, uh, in subsequent generations, had the effect of canceling out Scripture's claim to be presenting facts that are normative for our thinking. Uh, Kantian faith became kind of a byword for, for religious intuition. And uh, necessary truths of enlightenment reason, like the impossibility of miracles, uh, increasingly became the measure for Christian conviction. And Christian conviction was often reduced to, uh, to moralism with uh, some pietism allowed. Basically, uh, faith becomes more religious intuition. Um, and th that's with the help of, uh, of uh, another uh, liberal leader, Friedrich Schleiermacher, who uh, located uh, our perception of God not in the revelation of God to man through scripture and history, uh, but more through religious intuition. Uh, how, did, how did Schlatter counter this? Well, uh, first of all, I think we have to say Schlatter was, was, was brilliant. He, he had a great philosophical mind. 
he actually wrote a metaphysics. Uh, he gave lectures on the history of philosophy at the University of Tübingen. So he had a philosophical acumen that's not common among biblical scholars. Uh, he had learned Kant uh, from high school on, so uh, he knew the Kant corpus. And then he had a commitment to the truth that was revealed in scripture. He, he thought that this uh, constitute, a, constitute a body of, of knowledge, which he didn't think that, that Kant, uh, Kantian thinking uh, was qualified to, to cancel out. So he articulated the teaching of the Bible and uh, in his dogmatics, uh, a theological construal of the world and, and of scripture by uh, the demonstration of its coherence and its correspondence with, with things as we see them. Uh, seeing was very big in his exegesis. Kant uh, did not have a way to cancel out a biblical construal, uh, a dogmatic construal, an exegetical construal of the witness of scripture or of God through scripture and the world. That's very interesting. Thank you, Prof. Bob. You just mentioned Friedrich Schleiermacher, and of course he was this towering figure at the University of Berlin. Uh, he did not believe in the miracles of Jesus, we know, but there are also many others uh, at this time, like for, uh, a bit later was Adolf von Harnack, before we had Ritschel, we had F.C. Bauer, we had um, Herder, we had De Wetter, we had at Heidelberg, we had Paulus, most of whom denied the miracles of Jesus. Uh, and over time, we have the situation where people like Schlatter were persecuted and vilified and bullied. Can you tell us a bit more about that and also how in contemporary settings there is discrimination against conservative biblical scholars? Well, as, as far as discrimination against uh, biblical or, or uh, evangelical scholars, uh, this is something that um, uh, has gone on. When you read Schlatter's biography, uh, you can see how the, uh, the faculty at Bern in Switzerland sort of circled up the wagons, did everything they could to prevent him uh, from teaching on their faculty. Um, I wouldn't want to be specific about um, how this is being manifest today um, because it, it, it might get uh, people in trouble. And also it, it's hard to know exactly uh, who is discriminating against whom. It, it would be easy to pass along hearsay. But um, I will just say there, there have been many cases of, of qualified scholars who've been de denied advancement because um, of, of their open biblical convictions. And, and an example I, I would point to that, that's, that is public, uh, Ulrich Wilkins, uh, a retired German uh, bishop and a New Testament scholar, um, uh, has been, been interviewed uh, in a number of settings and has talked about all the people that have, have done doctorates under him since the late 1960s who've been denied uh, academic appointments. And, and one of the more recent cases uh, was a scholar, uh, and this was in connection, I think, with Armin, with, with uh, Klaus Berger. Uh, Armin Baum in, in Germany um, was, had excellent qualifications, but was not allowed to, to move on into uh, an academic post. So this happens, and it also happens in that uh, uh, scholars who publish with a certain um, commitment uh, or conviction about the truth of the Bible, they're simply not invited to apply to posts. And um, if, you, if you look at the faculty of, of a lot of major graduate schools or seminaries of certain conviction, you'll see that there are only people there with uh, general religious convictions like, like, uh, like they have, and those are not the, the, the convictions of the historic uh, church but uh, that's, that's what they want to try to keep out of their pedagogy. Yes, thank you, Prof. Bob, for mentioning Ulrich Wilkins. Uh, I want to encourage uh, theology students to get this book that you wrote, and you have a translated interview with him here at the back, and I just want to read a little bit further to encourage us. Uh, here in the Q&A at the back, he said, I should have done more. I should have had a stronger hand in the training of pastoral candidates. I could have influenced the future pastors themselves. Back then, it already required courage for someone to testify to their faith in Jesus Christ and to take the Bible seriously as Holy Scripture. Pastoral trainees 
all came from university programs where the professors had already talked them out of such convictions. And then he says, I'm afraid that I didn't speak up enough about this, but just mentioned it casually. And then after this, he talked about some persecution. And this is, this is what happened with him. He said, I became the target of the animosity of virulent feminist theologians. Rarely have I ever encountered such spiteful people, he said. And then he explained how he became ill with pancreatic cancer. And then after operation, he became much better. And then he dedicated his time to writing a six volume theology of the New Testament. And this is what happened with him. Fellow professors gave him the silent treatment. That's often how they do that, isn't it? They just ignore the scholarship of those scholars. Um, let me ask something about J. Gretchen Major. We know he went to Germany. He studied under Wilhelm Hermann. He almost became a, a disciple of him. Um, and also von Harnack. We know von Harnack, who famously rejected key elements of the Apostles' Creed, where he said that, for instance, a Christian who has grown mature in the understanding of the gospel and church history cannot avoid being offended by several statements of the Apostles' Creed. But we also know that Schlatter, who was a contemporary of both Wilhelm Hermann and also Adolf von Harnock, can you tell us briefly why their work was so powerful and how Schlatter was able to counter their views through a very rigorous biblical theology? As far as uh, Schlatter and people like Wilhelm Hermann and Adolf von Harnack, uh, uh, Schlatter could see that uh, what uh, liberal theology was doing was taking Christian terms and using uh, the form of, of uh, church practice and ritual and uh, investing a, a meaning that was, that was foreign to uh, Christian confession and practice. And theology really became a, a, man, a religious manifestation of idealist uh, philosophy and, and tradition. Uh, God became, you could say, the power of, of goodness. And Jesus was an exemplary man. And, and, and probably the, the end result of this was, was best framed by uh, an American scholar who, who who grew up in it? He was Germanic descent, but he he uh, he lived in America, and his name was uh, H. Richard Niebuhr. And uh, he said, in, "In liberalism, a god without wrath brought man or brings man without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross." And so. Uh, this is not Christianity. This is religious idealism. Uh, the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, and the ultimate uh, value of the human soul. It's a very high view of man. It's a view in which man does not need a savior, except maybe the savior of education, or the savior of science, or the savior of technology. We can, we can save ourselves. We can build a brighter planet, a smarter planet on our own. We don't need um, the blood sacrifice of the God-man, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins. And uh, Schlatter understood that this was not Christianity. And so given his view of God, given his view of, uh, of Jesus Christ, his view of the human condition, um, he repudiated liberal theology and uh, saw his work as a counterweight to it. As, as indeed uh, the king of Prussia did when he established a chair at Berlin uh, to call uh, Schlatter in to teach to counteract the influence of Adolf von Harnack. We know from your biography that you translated that Schlatter was vilified, marginalized, even persecuted. Uh, he struggled to get his habilitation to teach. Uh, he was called in and said they will make sure that he will not become a professor. We know later on also he was uh, in the deep waters at Berlin where his colleagues challenged him when he chose church above the academy. So a provocative question could be, if Martin Luther, John Calvin, Ursinus from Heidelberg, and even Schlatter would be with us today, do you think 
they would have been willing to teach at secular universities where all sorts of new policies have been brought in that might lead a person to compromise his convictions. Well, as far as Schlatter's possible comfort level, or uh, the comfort level, of, or a Calvin, or an Orsinus, or, or uh, someone else, as far as their comfort level in teaching in the modern setting, uh, I, I'm sure it would be baffling uh, to many of them as to why uh, teachers of Christian conviction uh, would be part of establishments which are uh, so radically anti-Christian. Uh, I'm not saying that Christians today should not be part of those establishments, uh, because in some places that's that's our our calling and our only way to to function in our vocations, but it's 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 quite a foreign thing, and it, and it's one of the um, uh, undersung aspects of of post enlightenment development. Is that more and more you have people whose convictions are hostile to Christianity, and they're teaching ministers, they're teaching theologians, they're they're setting the table for upcoming generations by the way that they're uh, shaping the minds and the souls of, of those that they're teaching. And, and I think to, to summarize my answer to your question, I think Schlatter and others would feel like it was, would be a contradiction in terms. It's a contradiction in terms to be teaching, if you understand your teaching in some sense to be uh, a confession of, of what you think is true about a God who exists and is revealed in Christ, if you're told, well, you can't say that, but go ahead and teach the discipline. They would say, well, you know, uh, and, and Schlatter did say this, uh, church comes before faculty. And uh, if I have to decide whether I'm going to side with the church or decide with scholarship, uh, then uh, there's no question what I have to do. And, and he did this in, in, in Berlin. So, you know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, he, he founded an underground seminary. And I think that a lot of these people, that's what they would do today, is that they would find a place above ground or underground where they could uh, confess their faith and uh, ground others in a reading of scripture and an understanding of Christian confession that comports with the testimony of the Bible and the testimony of the confessing church through the centuries. Uh, actually, that's why in the United States, you find so many evangelical seminaries and, and there's a lot to say and criticism of them. But in the 20th century, uh, the, the old line seminaries like Yale Divinity School and Harvard Divinity School and Duke Divinity School, uh, they more and more became hostile to confessional Christianity. Uh, they're the people about whom H. Richard Niebuhr said, a God without wrath brought man without sin and so forth. So uh, confessing Christians founded seminaries like Dallas Theological Seminary and Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And, and the Southern Baptists uh, had seminaries that uh, they, they expanded and, and, and they founded some more. Uh, this seminary was founded in the 1950s, right. Covenant Theological Seminary. So I, I think that would be uh, where some of uh, people like Schlatter would be, is that they would be teaching in uh, independent seminaries rather than in the university because they wouldn't be called there in the first place. Thank you very much, Prof. Bob. I remember giving lectures in England at a secular university a while back where I was given the lecturing and I wanted to supplement the bi bibliography. So to bring some balance, I wanted to add some John Stott and Tom Wright and so on, because all of the things that they had to study was left wing. And I was frowned upon for bringing that balance uh, for students. Now, that also reminds me of a very important critical review essay that you wrote on a book uh, edited by Christopher Hayes and, and Christopher Ansbury on historical criticism and evangelical faith a few years ago, where they sort of charge evangelicals for not taking historical criticism seriously. And one of the editors was Christopher Hayes, who said he did some research at Bonn. Uh, and what I found quite ironic was I did research at Bonn as well, and there I was placed under pressure to compromise the bodily resurrection of Jesus. And I felt that often you have at some critical universities, liberals who put pressure on evangelicals to compromise key doctrines and truths given historical critical developments. Can you try to encourage Christians who are battling the pressure to compromise when it comes to the trustworthiness of the gospel and of faith? Uh, uh, first of all, uh, Evangelicals uh, 
have to come into the academy and, and they have to get academic training and, and they have to be uh, they have to be good scholars. And so there, there may be some things that, uh, in fact, there will be lots of things that they have to learn that they don't agree with. Uh, it reminds me perhaps of uh, Daniel and, and his friends being shipped out to Babylon and they had to learn, you know, the learning of the Babylonians, uh, but they did so. And, uh, you know, three of them got thrown in the fiery furnace and, and Daniel got thrown in the lion's den. Uh, God preserved them. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they knew God might not preserve them, but they said, we're still not going to bow down. So they, they, they did their service in the secular world to, to which they were called, but they stayed true to God in, in their confession and, and, for example, their dietary habits. And uh, they, they were true to, to what God revealed to his people that they need to be and to do. So we need to be willing to engage in so-called critical scholarship. We need to learn to be sympathetic toward it. Uh, Jesus said to love your enemies and, and pray for those who persecute you. Uh, we need to learn to be compassionate. Uh, we need to learn to uh, realize that we have a lot of uh, uh, skeletons in our own closet as a tradition. Uh, evangelicals uh, have, have their weaknesses and not everything that every evangelical scholar says is good or true or as brilliant and insightful as things that uh, uh, liberal scholars or, or atheist scholars may say. Uh, having said all that, uh, there, there is a, a community of learning that rejects uh, confessional Christianity. Uh, there is a, a communion of learning, a confession, a historical a trajectory. Uh, today it's dominant in confessing Christianity around the world. The, the, world, the world Christianity is growing uh, massively, and it's not doing so among people that don't believe the Bible. It's doing uh, so among people who do believe the Bible. And so we need to see ourselves as participating in that tradition. Uh, if, if you want a, a learned work that, that talks about this, I recommend um, Biography of Thomas Oden. It's about uh, something like a change of heart. And um, he, he was deeply complicit in the uh, post-Christian tradition as a Christian leader and theologian. And then he had a conversion experience as a result of a Jewish scholar telling him, you're not a Christian. Uh, if you don't believe in the resurrection, uh, you don't know your own tradition. Go back and read Athanasius. So uh, uh, Thomas Oden, I think, points the way uh, not only with, with uh, his experience, but also with his scholarship by the, by the 1980s and 90s. He's, he's writing quite a bit about the roots of Christianity and uh, construals of Christianity that, are, that uh, take part in what he calls the consensual tradition. And there's no reason why evangelicals today can't be um, uh, confessing both their faith in Jesus and, and also their command of primary sources and of languages and, and of, of scholarship and interacting with scholarship uh, for the betterment of the church. And uh, we hope for uh, an evangelizing voice uh, in the broader world and, and culture and, uh, and the academy. Thank you, Prof. Bob. That is amazing. We can talk the whole day and I hope we will one day be able to see eye to eye uh, and have a much more in-depth discussion. This is really just an appetizer and introduction for students. But I, I think let's try to wrap up today. Um, you have written so many books. I mean, it's quite intimidating just looking at the list. You've, you've done commentaries on a number of books and I've got a stack of your other books here. But uh, let me try to finish off today with one question for you as a Presbyterian. What, Professor Bob, is your only hope in life and in death? It happens to be the same question that uh, uh, begins the Heidelberg Catechism. So um, my answer is the answer that's been confessed for centuries in, in my tradition. Uh, my only hope in life and in death is that I'm not my own but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, 
by his Holy Spirit assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Uh, Dr. Mulder, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for the invitation to be, to be here today and uh, to share these ideas with you. Thank you very much for that, Prof. Bob. Let's wrap this all up. Can I ask you, um, I think there might be hundreds, maybe even thousands of undergraduate theology students across the planet, in Asia, in North America, in Europe, who are battling critical scholarship. And can you do a prayer that God will preserve them, that they will not compromise? Yes, that they will take scholarship seriously, but that they will persevere in the faith. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for the promise of your son that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. And we know that, especially in Western Christianity in the last couple of centuries, there's been a, a great turning away from the faith that was delivered once for all to the saints. And uh, we know that uh, leaders and in institutions and many scholars are quite aware of this, and they take pride in it, and they see as their mission to destroy uh, the biblical faith of those that come into the academy to learn. So Lord, would you have mercy on our world? Uh, would you have mercy and show great grace to those that you are calling into your service who need to do formal learning and need to uh, interact with ideas and books and articles uh, that uh, on the surface are detrimental and del deleterious uh, to their faith. Uh, thank you that um, uh, we can repent of our sins and grow in faith. All of us who come into learning know that we're not perfect. We know we don't know everything. We know we have a lot to learn, and we know that we need to learn a lot about things that we don't agree with. Having said that, I pray that you would uh, help what students learn that they don't agree with, uh, not to eat away at their heart and soul, but uh, keep your people strong in the faith uh, in, in scripture and uh, the apostolic and the prophetic revelation of Old and New Testament that uh, you have given to your church. Uh, strengthen your church by raising up new generations of students in all the continents of the globe. Uh, provide teachers and leaders for your church. And we pray that in generations to come that there would be a, a turn back to the training of ministers in a high level of scholarship and learning, but one that honors you instead of uh, seeking to redefine and to evade you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.